Okay, assalamu alaikum everybody. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, I'm super excited for today's session. Um, we're gonna, of course, have an incredible halakha, but um, even more exciting for me, um, I have the actual, the, the pleasure of introducing, um, to give the introduction today, one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, her name is Marwa, She's also known as Mademoiselle Mimi. Um, if you have been following um, the weekly emails or you know, our videos, um, you will know that uh, Marwa and I actually had a conversation years ago about the hijab and, um, and also being in the fashion industry because Marwa is um, really um, a, a superstar um, known for um, modest fashion and is, just has a style like no one else. And just I'm always really proud to see how she elevates um, the dignity of Muslim women through her artistry, um, it's, you know, knowing her personally, um, it's not just about looking good or, you know, artistry, but it's about trying to um, be as beautiful inside and outside, you know, stand for causes, um, really present um, a dignified face for Muslim women. Because um, aside from showing up on the pages of Vogue Arabia and a number of different really, you know, huge magazines, um, she also, um, has you know made her um, her presence um, felt with social causes um, and you know especially in, in time of COVID you know she used to go to New York Fashion Week all the time and would be in you know street fashion and and you know be filmed and all of that um, but since that has all kind of died down with COVID she has turned her influence towards elevating social causes which has been really beautiful um, and what you know she's brilliant aside from being beautiful. Um, but she um, noticed that one of the topics that the sheikh raised in the khutbah this past week um, was about the hijab legislation happening in France. And so was interested to know who was talking about it, what media was reporting about it, you know, what Muslims were talking about it. And it was basically zero. Um, and it was very um, interesting that it was something that the, the sheikh here highlighted before anyone else. Um, and she took it upon herself um, with the help of our amazing social media superstar here, Ramin, um, to bring it to um, the forefront on Instagram and other social media platforms. And so that um, Usuli actually had quite a, a day yesterday, kind of blew up Instagram. Um, so I really wanted um, uh, Marwa to come and talk about this issue because obviously this is um, you know, an issue that is really important for um, hijabi women. and. Um, I mean, all Muslim women, it's not just hijabi women, but because she is someone who is on the forefront um, and you know has a lot of very interesting and important insight um, and is very articulate about this issue, I really wanted her to have a chance to um, talk about it um, here. And woman power, especially after Surah Maryam, is very exciting. Um, it's my honor to introduce Mademoiselle Mimi. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I'm Marwa, as Grace told you with that very generous introduction. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Uh, this is really unexpected, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak. Um, Grace and the professor and I and like students here were talking about what was happening basically in France after the khutbah, if you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. It was really powerful. And even the, the halakha we did afterwards on Saturday about women was also kind of just adding to that narrative. And so as many of us have seen since then on social media, things have really picked up in terms of what's happening with women in France. And I really wanted Usuli to be part of that narrative, so we kind of jumped on it and shared a lot about what the professor's been saying for a long time about women and hijab, but especially just at the uh, Friday prayer khutbah we had. Um, so just the background, I am a student at <laughs> Project Illumin, but I also am in the fashion uh, industry and in modest fashion, of course. Um, and, you know, after seeing what was happening in France, it just reminded me that this kind of the, what the French government is doing also affects me here in the U.S. because I wear hijab, but also even in my own industry. And so I actually had published this online yesterday um, and sent it to a lot of people in the, in the industry, which I think they hadn't really made the connection about hijab just on a global scale and what this does to women. 
Um, but I was talking about essentially a story um, about what happened to me at Fashion Week that I never <laughs> really planned to share, but I felt like this was the right moment. Um, you know, during Fashion Week, one of the biggest things is street style. And it's important because it's really how real women wear the clothing on the streets and so it's kind of like a frenzy where there's hundreds of photographers on the street looking to capture how real women are wearing these pieces off the runway or you know new designers etc and so with modest fashion you know i had picked up a lot in the last two three years obviously since the pandemic it's not really happening um but essentially I had gotten featured, like Grace was talking about, in some magazines and Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and a lot of like American and international publications, except of course in France. And so I was really curious as to why they weren't kind of paying attention, especially to the modest fashion movement, um, which was really hot and really coming up. And essentially, I mean, it's very much a young side of the fashion industry still, but everybody was talking about it. And so one of the photographers that I knew was supposed to be capturing these events, I asked him, you know, can we have a meeting? I'd love to talk to you more about your work. And so we met over coffee and I was like, you know, how come you don't photograph women in a headscarf? Like hijabi women, Muslim women in general, but you know, modest fashion has kind of been associated with women in hijab because they're visibly Muslim and they're really leading the charge for modest fashion. So that's the only reason I say that, um, why he wasn't, you know, photographing a hijabi woman. And so he told me, well, your photos don't sell. <laughs> and essentially magazines don't want your photos. Editors don't want your photos and no one wants to publish you. And so I don't take your photos. And he won't even essentially take his photos for his own personal, take our photos for his own personal uh, portfolio and it's not like there's hundreds of us at Fashion Week either there's only like five or six of us so it's really easy you know to feature us when usually these spreads about you know street fashion are 50 to 200 photos sometimes if you go on Vogue it's like 250 plus photos and not a single one sometimes features a Muslim woman in a headscarf and so I had noticed season after season this guy hadn't featured any of us and I asked him and he was really just blunt about it and I was caught off <laughs> guard uh, you know, what he had said basically was a reason and that, you know, essentially it's not just that someone like himself is not going to make money off of it and so he has no interest in us, but when he sends it to the editors who are going to feature it in print or online, digitally, there's still no interest for us either and they don't want us to be part of this narrative. And I told them, like, you know, you should be featuring us on your personal platform as part of your portfolio, but also the fact that you're not taking our photos, you're basically erasing us from this whole narrative. I mean, we're coming to Fashion Month to speak about fashion and contribute to the arts, and essentially we're not included at all. It's like we weren't even there, we're not visible, we didn't exist. We're not part of any aspect of fashion. And, you know, I don't know if he really took that messaging to heart and understood it, or was he just really thinking about his paycheck, but now with what's happening in france it really reminded me of that conversation and we had this conversation about like two years ago and now seeing kind of what french government is trying to do with women under age 18 it made me think about okay well modest fashion has really been driven by youth by teenagers and young college students if they're not allowed to wear a headscarf until they reach the age of 18 then modest fashion is completely gone like this whole space doesn't exist and if other European countries follow suit and kind of get on this bandwagon, and it's even if they don't pass the law, the narrative exists where, you know, we can be hostile to Muslim women, we can, you know, harass them if they have a headscarf, we can treat them differently. And that's enough damage to really, I think, damage the confidence that women have even wearing the headscarf publicly, let alone in spaces like modest fashion. And I think one of the things that was surprising is that over the weekend, you know, a handful of Muslim women had reposted like this image um, where it said hashtag hands off my hijab, but it took me reaching out to my colleagues in fashion who are not Muslim from the black community, from the Asian community to post this for Muslims to finally actually get on and start posting it themselves. Um, and I know at the Holocaust here, we talk a lot about being a witness to injustices, being a witness to things happening where you should have a voice and speak. But it was non-Muslims who were really there to speak about what was happening to French Muslim hijabi women. 
And it really made me think about, okay, well, what's the future for hijabi women if Muslims won't even stand up for their own causes? And what's the future for my own industry of modest fashion if, you know, in times like this, we don't say anything? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marwa. I, you know, I was so impressed by, um, you know, Marwa really um, reached out to the people on Instagram who had massive followings and made them aware of what, what was being said here at Usuli um, and just single handedly. Um, put this issue on the map. We have a hashtag that says leave Muslim women alone. And it just literally um, blew up, but it was, you know, brilliant because I mean, you know, I don't really know very much about social media strategy, so I leave it to people who are much better at that. But I know that from what Marwa and Ramin were able to do is that they were really um, able to spark a lot of passion among people who really are standing on the front line of justice. And it was, um, you know, people who were, as Marwa said, you know, on, on black issues, Asian issues, LGBTQ issues, you know, people who are out there fighting for things that matter, where Muslims should really be fighting. And it was very embarrassing and hurtful to see that Muslims did not stand up and support or retweet or, you know, use their followers' influ or influence with their followers to highlight this issue until it became sort of a recognized issue. Like then it was okay to jump on the bandwagon, but nobody really wanted to stick their neck out and be you know, at the forefront of justice. So kudos to Marwa and Ramin for recognizing the opportunity and really um, you know, turning it into something important. And um, you know, hopefully we're gonna continue to raise this issue um, because you know, a lot of people maybe still really don't know what we're talking about is, you know, the, the legislation in France that says that women under, or girls, I guess, under the age of 18 are not allowed to wear hijab. And also that um, women who are wearing hijab are not allowed to accompany their young children in hijab without risk of being um, harassed or fined or I'm not sure what else. Um, but it's, it's a full-on assault. Um, and one of the um, very... Um, interesting people who actually reposted was Diet Prada, um, who takes on a lot of these really important causes and was very interested, very interesting, pull, pulled together a mosaic of women, religious women from all different faiths and their head coverings and said, pop quiz, which of these covered women is getting outlawed in France? Which is really fascinating because you've got, you know, nuns, you've got people, Buddhists, um, Jains, I mean, everyone under the sun who wears a head cover, but really it's only the Muslim women that are being targeted. Um, and interestingly, this comes right after our Surah Maryam, which, um, if you haven't watched it yet, was all about women empower empowerment and the role of women, the, the really critical role of women in making Islam come to life from the time of the Prophet and forward. And, you know, it was really... Um, a way for us, I think, in our time and age to be empowered and be excited about the role that we can play on in causes like this. Um, you know, I would like to see, you know, just one idea I was throwing out, well, what if all Muslim women started looking, dressing like nuns? You know, what are these people going to do, you know, as a, as a social statement? I mean, why don't we start thinking out of the box about how we as Muslim women can protest this issue? So anyway, um, again, thank you so much, Marwa. Um, that was wonderful. And um, you know, I look forward to having more incredible introductions and more engagement with women um, in, you know, in this space. So alhamdulillah. And looking forward to today's halakha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanallah ali al-Azim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammad al-Wusul rahmatan lil-alameen. خاتم الأنبياء والرسل أجمعين وعلى آله وأصحابه وطباب إحسان إلى يوم الدين ومشح صدري والسل لأمر أحلى مقتر وحساني Just so that it's clear um, the, the law banning women under 18 from wearing the hijab uh, has passed in France and it, it is the actual, it is the law so um, 
if your parents and you have a child under 18 who's wearing the hijab, you could get into a lot of tr trouble, a lot of trouble. Um, and um, because obviously the, the child is not the actual offender, but the parents of the child are the offenders. And the law that is being discussed and has not passed yet is the law that would make it um, a crime for the muhajjaba to accompany her child in public. Um, uh, she would be subject to a fine. Um, but as Marwa said, the point is, yet again, France uh, leads the colonial project that um, seeks to that that effectively uh, colonizes the the Muslim space by targeting Muslim women, and they they've done that since you know in their whole history of their whole colonial history in in Africa and in Algeria and. Um, and of course, the big irony is that France at the same time, and not just France, but Europe in general, at the same time that they have this sworn hostility to veiling in all its forms, um, they sexually fetishize Muslim women. And they, they are the ones responsible for the whole industry of erotica of muhajjabas. Um, uh, which now has even exploded after the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan into some very dark themes and very disturbing themes. And, um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I get Muslims, especially young Muslims, that will write me uh, something to the effect of, you're always talking about problems, but you never tell us what to do. And I think what Marwa was pointing out, Marwa and Grace were pointing out, were really important. That you know, here's a really good example. Um, all that Muslims needed to do was to retweet something. That's all they needed to do. Was just retweet it. To, to just contribute mildly, minimal effort. But they didn't do so until they saw non-Muslims, famous, um, famous non-Muslims getting on the bandwagon. And then they started retweeting. And, and this is precisely, it's not an issue of not knowing what to do. It's a precisely that we Muslims suffer from a defeated psychology. We, are, we, we have the psychology of a defeated people. Um, it's, which also includes the, the the problem that every Muslim wants to be the beacon and fountain of authority. Every Muslim wants to be, no one wants to be the soldier. Everyone wants to be the leader. No one wants to be the receiver of fiqh. Everyone wants to be the giver of fiqh. No one wants to be the propagator of ideas. Everyone wants to be the giver of ideas. That's symptomatic of a defeated people as well. And as a result, we're in a complete stalemate because we are constantly, all of us, reinventing the wheel. Uh, we refuse to play supportive roles uh, because we all want leading roles. And we want leading roles whether we deserve leading roles or whether we've put in, invested the effort or time um, to have leading roles, and as a result, we're frozen. Because I am sure that the reason that all these Muslims that they sent the message to did not retweet it is they probably saw that it's coming from another Muslim scholar, and they thought to themselves, well, uh, it, it's, you know, I'm not going to retweet something that belongs to some other Muslim scholar, it, you know, because that is somehow conceding authority to that person. Very childish. This is how defeated people act. Childish. Childish. 
This is not how professionals or intellectuals or serious people act. And then when they saw that someone famous jumped on the bandwagon, they thought, oh, well, now it, I can attribute it to this famous person, not to another Muslim scholar. It's sickening. I mean, it just, it makes you... I don't know. We, 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 there is a real ailment of sincerity and, and pure intentionality. Um, okay. So, inshallah, today we will deal with Surah Tariq. And, um, As you all know, of course, Surah Tariq is very short, but it is um, interestingly a surah that has received a considerable amount of attention and sparked um, a lot of narratives in the Islamic tradition and um, this is one of those surah that I think the best way to approach it is um, through the the methodology I used before um, of presenting three narratives or three approaches. Uh, because of the of the not every surah I can do this with, but with Surah Tariq, I think it is fitting. The traditional approach will be the first approach that I present. The the sort of um, the tr the approach that you find in all the Nakli transmission based tafsirs, um, um, uh, like Ibn Kathir or Tabari, um, Qurtubi. Um, the, the traditional approach and how they understood Surah Tariq. Then the second approach will be the Sufi-esque approach. Um, I don't like the word esoteric in this context because of the connotation that it carries among uh, um, in modern circles. Uh, but the sufi ask approach clearly uh, differed from the traditional approach in some very significant ways, and Surah Tariq with them played a very different role. And then the third and last approach will be my own approach to Surah Tariq, uh, which, as you will see, is... Um, very, I mean, in, in many ways, it's very similar to the Sufi-esque approach, but with some uh, important differences that we'll discuss. So, the first traditional, the second, the Sufi-esque, and then the third will be uh, my approach. And Surah Tariq is well, one, it's uh, uh, for me personally, it's a, uh, it's a surah I've, I've always felt a personal connection with because my brother's name is Tariq. And of course, as a kid, you know, I was fascinated why, by, why isn't there a surah Khalid, but there is a surah Tariq. Um, so, my, you know, that, that, was a, that was an issue between uh, my brother and me, but, um, but it was always dear to me because of, um, of the fact that it's my brother's name. Um, and, you know, it raised this sort of interesting question, well, why should we call a, a person a Tariq? But actually it makes a lot of sense, as we'll see. And Surah Tariq is a Meccan Surah by consensus of all. And uh, it is 
it is in the stream of Thor um, that I think constituted the backbone of the Islamic message. Um, it, it is in terms of order of revelation it's by majority opinion probably 36 in order of revelation um, and even those who you know disagree they might have said it's number 35 or number 37 so but it is clearly it, it's probably 36 it's the most certain. and it was revealed after Surat al-Balad and before Surat al-Qamar we, we haven't covered no, have, we did cover Surat al-Balad in here. Uh, we did. We haven't covered Surat al-Qamar, right? Um, so it was revealed after the Balad and before Surat al-Qamar, and that means that it was revealed after Surat Qaf, before Surat Sad. It was revealed before Surah that we covered, like Yasin and Al Furqan and Fatir. Um, but at the same time revealed after critical surah like Al-Ikhlas, Al-Najm, um, uh, Al-Buruj, Surah Al-Teen, uh, Al-Qari'a, Qiyam, Al-Humaza, uh, and so on. And what among the things that is fascinating about Surah Tariq is that um, we have reports that the Prophet ﷺ in, in the period of the um, taking the Islamic message to the public, so when the Islamic message emerges out of the secrecy phase in Dar al-Arqam, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, w would recite it in public in Mecca and we even have these interesting reports uh, that he recited Surah Tariq as he was trying to get uh, the people of Thaqif to um, support him and that Mecca commented about the, the surah, well, yeah, th th this is very beautiful, but if, if uh, we know that this, this man is a fraud, so Thaqif, don't follow him. So we, we have Surah Tariq sort of in the early dynamics appear in, in, the, in the narratives of the early dynamics of the, of the Islamic message. But what's really interesting is that the impact of Surah Tariq in terms of its impact on theology um, takes place really long after the Prophet ﷺ, uh, dies. So it has an impact on the Muslim narrative, on the Muslim theological framework um, uh, as we will see, um, after the, the 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 period of the founders of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, and this in part is because of the language of Surah Tariq itself, that it it is phrased in a way that leaves the gates of interpretation open and um, teases the, the imagination of the interpreter and sort of prov provokes the moral and ethical um, uh, senses of the reader uh, or the receiver of the surah. Uh, and ch in many ways challenges the the reader to to understand a deeper meaning to the surah, if you will. Okay. 
So let's start first with the traditional approach and how it understood Surah Tariq. A hadith that is well known both to traditionals and non-traditionals is um, uh, is a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says something to the effect of "Wailun liman qara'a hadhi al-ayah thumma masaha biha thumma masaha biha sablatin," which means that. Woe to, pers- to the person who reads this surah and does not pay fikr or dhikr, who does not pay attention to what it says. So we we know that the Prophet ﷺ was urging Muslims from the get go to pay careful attention to what Surah Tariq was saying. Um, And this was known to, the, to both the literalist approaches and the non-literalist approaches, but obviously it, it affected them in different ways. So it starts out quite simply with Samai wa Tariq, wa ma adraka ma Tariq in Najm al the sky, the heavens, a reference to what is above, and it's a broad reference, and the Tariq, and then the rhetorical question, and do you know what the Tariq is? And the answer to the rhetorical question is a Najm al quite literally the piercing star. Now, we know that a Tariq in Arabic was um, anything anything that comes through the night that is unexpected is a tariq. Anything that knocks is a tariq. And in old Arabic, a tariq was understood as something that especially occurs at night. But in by the time the surah tariq was revealed in Arabic usage, a tariq didn't necessarily have to be something that occurs at night. A tariq could be anything that is unexpected or surprising. So in Arabic we say tariq. Uh, for street. Why, why is a street called tariq? It's because feet figuratively knock on the street. As feet walk on the street, they're as if, you know, they're knocking on the street. One of the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ is that he would say, uh, he would ask refuge, would ask Allah's protection from a tawariq illa tariqan yaturqu bi khair that uh, the 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 prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would say allah protect me from any tariq uh, except a tariq that comes with goodness meaning allah protect me from any unexpected occurrence any surprising unexpected thing unless it's something good um Again, in, in Arabic usage, if you light a fire and feed the fire so it, it, it gives a good glow, uh, that, uh, that is described as turqun nar, meaning you uh, make the fire bigger or glow greater, feeding the fire. So if I say utruqun nar, I'm not telling you to knock at the fire, I'm telling you feed the fire. You know. Bring back bring the fire to, to greater life. So when 
the surah starts out with the heavens and the tariq and then says that rhetorical question well what is the tariq and then points out specifically to a star in the traditional interpreters said well what is the common usage at the time of revelation and the common usage if you are looking at the star and you're looking for stars that we describe as Tariq, well, there are specific candidates for that. There's the morning star. Arabs used to call the morning star a Tariq. Um, there is Jupiter um, that they also used to describe as a Tariq. There are certain falling stars that they would describe as Tariq, these stars that shoot through the heavens and seem to shoot back and forth in the heavens. And of course, because the, the Arabs navigated using stars, um, their knowledge of stars and the position of stars and the role of stars was quite significant. I mean, the stars was, if you, if you didn't know stars well, you're going to get lost in the desert, especially if you travel at night, and that's quite disastrous. Now, but, that begs the question, well, yes, but what about this piercing star, whether it's the morning star, whether it's Jupiter, or whether it's the star that appears at the beginning of Maghrib, there is a hadith that says that there is no prayer between Asra and Tariq, means there is no prayer between Asra and Maghrib, the, the star that appears at the beginning of Maghrib. So, I mean, in a sense of, so what? And the traditional interpreters answered this question by saying, well, Allah frequently asks us to reflect on the miraculousness of the skies, the, 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 what surrounds the earth, and the, the configuration of stars in themselves, and the ability, the, the way that Allah has created these stars, they often give us guidance on how to travel, how to navigate, how to know north from south, east from west. And in fact, <coughs> through the visibility of stars or non-visibility of stars, we can predict whether it's safe to travel or not to travel. The, Allah is reminding us of all the bounties that Allah has bestowed upon us. Excuse me. And furthermore, that the complexity of the heavens and the configuration of stars in, in the heavens cannot occur by coincidence. There is an engineer, there is aql fa'al, as they used to say, called an active intellect behind uh, the configuration of constellations and the configuration of galaxies and the way that things are organized um, and organized to preserve human life. Interestingly, even the, the early Arabs were aware that Very small, and I, I think it's probably that they had some experiences with uh, uh, with comets or meteorite, meteorites or something like that, because they were very aware how fragile human life is in relation to what comes from the heavens. They they were, and they they often have poetry about the heavens when the heavens get gets mad you know, and, and, and then sends them a comet or sends them a meteorite and how it just destroys everything and how they've seen cattle, you know, all perish overnight. Um, 
or water that a tribe has been sustaining the life of a tribe for decades go bad and become entirely unusable just because of what comes from the heavens. Uh, I mean, they, they that these things lived in their memory, and they were keenly aware that um, if the balance between the heavens and the earth is off, their life is in danger. And so for the traditional interpreters, they say, you know, again, a wise person would reflect on how intricate that balance is and uh, how easily, how, how easy it would be for with very small changes in the heavens for life to perish on earth and for life to be unsustainable or even unsustainable certain parts of the earth. Um, so while if you look at the traditional Tefasir, you'll find these long discussions about you know, is it Jupiter? Is it this star? Is it that star? I mean, there's, it's all, a Najmul Thaq could refer to any of them. So there's no way to resolve this debate uh, because we don't have, their methodology relies on transmissions, what is transmitted. And there is nothing transmitted that tells us it's this specific star or that. It's not this specific star. Okay. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, if you understand that the maker of the heavens organized the heavens in a way that would, so that it can be advantageous for a human life, and that that is remarkable in itself. Um, if you truly reflect on that and understand that, you will also understand that there is no soul that goes without a hafiz. A hafiz literally translates as a sustainer, protector, or a guardian. And in the traditional tafsir, they go into whether these, this is the hafiz that is referred to elsewhere in the Quran as hafaza in the plural, meaning angels who record your deeds, or is the Hafiz here a different type of heavenly creature, in other words, an angel, not that records the deeds, but that uh, there, there's, a, there's an old debate that goes back to Greek philosophy uh, about uh, and by the way, it's a debate that still goes on in modern philosophy about the nature of consciousness. What is consciousness? You know, this this question has troubled human beings for forever, for, from the, from the time of the Greeks till our modern day. I mean, you could read book after book after book, and you could read the approach of psychologists, the approach of psychiatrists, the approach of clinicians, the approach of you know, abstract philosophers, and just endless debates about what is consciousness. And whether we know that human beings on all living things, once they come to life, they act with energy. But where does this energy come from? And where does it go? You know, you have a cat. The cat is jumping around and meowing and eating and playing and doing whatever. And then the cat dies. And poof, it's just a body. Well, where is that energy that used to be in the cat? 
Where did it come from? Was it was it somehow preserved in sperm and egg from time immemorial? Well, so if the, when the cat gives birth to kittens, is the cat that gives birth to kittens has it? Is it a repository of energy that it delegates to these kittens, and then the kittens live with the energy until then they give in turn, but that doesn't make sense philosophically because that would require any one thing to be a repository of an enormous amount of energy that they can pass on to generations down the line, generation after generation after generation, and we know that, that that's not true. So where does the energy come from and where does it go? So Greek philosophers used to say energy needs an external provider. The Greeks, you know, whether they called them gods in the plural or they called them first causes or whatever they called them. But they basically said that you need something outside the frame of creation to be the giver of energy to everything from a human being who's alive to a star that shoots through the heavens. Because matter in it and of itself doesn't contain the energy. Doesn't, in of itself doesn't manufacture the energy. The energy seems to come from somewhere and we don't know from where. That debate, although it, of course, in the modern age, it it developed into, you know, more scientific sounding terms, but it's essentially the same debate that goes on. And it's, uh, you know, the debate between the new atheists and the, the creationists, it, it still goes on about the same thing. The, you know, the new atheists say, we don't need to answer the question of where energy comes from. Uh, in, uh, we just need, we need, just need to know that there is no God that is the creator of this energy. Because science will eventually answer the question of where the energy comes from. While the creationists say, well, science hasn't answered that question, and you, your belief that science will eventually answer that question is in itself a form of religious belief. Because you're believing in science, like a religion. That is, you know, science will come through with the truth. Although right now, science doesn't seem to have any indication that it can answer that question. Science knows how to exploit energy that exists. We can split the atom. We can do horrible things with nuclear energy and good things, but mostly horrible, in my humble view. Uh, but we, we, we don't know where that energy, the genesis of the energy and where it ultimately goes. Um, Um, you know, Einstein tells us that we know that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but anyway. Um, so, traditional, people of traditional tafsir then said that when Allah says for every soul there is a hafiz, it could mean the angels that keep your record, but it could also mean the angel or that that uh, is the source of energy so that you can fulfill your qadr, so you can fulfill your fate. So, you know, you, whatever fate you have in life, in order to fulfill it, you're going to need a certain energy that, that sort of like, you know, if you imagine like the fuel that is put into you, and that is the hafiz. Some traditional mufassirun said, no, the hafiz here, in inna kullu nafsin lama alayha hafiz, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is Allah himself, that we don't need 
the, the, the evidence, the, the reports that tell us about an angel that is a hafiz, there is a, a report that, well, uh, just so I make clear, there is a hadith that says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has made for every human being I forgot the number, but in the virtual army of angels that supply the human being with the life force, the energy, what we call the energy, that is needed during their lifetime. Some of the traditionists accepted this hadith, some traditionists didn't accept this hadith. Those who accepted it said the Hafiz is the life force, the energy source, and those who didn't accept it said, no, the Hafiz is Allah himself. Meaning that Allah is telling you, in the same way I was able to create the heavens uh, so intricately and with all its complexity and all its richness and all its apparently limitless aspects, um, don't think that any of you escape my guardianship or my observation or my witness or okay so let man consider uh, uh, so let man consider or let he let human beings reflect upon what what they were created from or from what they were created خلق من ماء دافق يخرج من بين الصلب والطرائب that they were created from gushing fluid issuing from صلب and طرائب I paused with صلب and طرائب because this is in traditional tafsirs this is a long debate A sulb in old classical Arabic, a sulb are the parts of the backbone, the lower parts of the backbone. So your lower backbones, these are the, the sulb. And there was a belief, I'm not, you know, um, there was a belief that uh, Human beings, that this the the lower backbone or the, the 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 lower part of the backbone, plays a critical role in the birth of human beings. And the taraib, in again in cla old classical Arabic, were the chest area between the breasts or above the breasts. And there was an old belief that a child it gets certain uh, parts of the child's nature from the, the, the backbone of the father and from the chest of the mother. However, however, a sulbu taraib doesn't necessarily mean this. It doesn't necessarily mean the old Arabic belief of the bone, the, the, the backbone of the father and the chest of the mother. Because it could simply mean a sulbu taraib. Um, yeah. Uh, the sulb could simply mean the bones and the um, the bones and the fluids of both mother and father. So that's uh, the other possible meaning. The study Quran says the loyans 
and pelvic arch, and that's a third possible meaning. That the Sulban Taraib could simply mean the loins and pelvic arch, and that would be a very reasonable interpretation of, the, of these words as well. I know, and again, I, I'm not an expert in, in this field, so I don't cover it, um, but I know that I, I, there was a, a, a scientist, a convert to Islam, I think a German scientist who wrote an article uh, about his Surah Tariq, and he said that studying the words that this is part of the scientific miracles of the Quran because, and I, I don't remember the article now because it was many, many years ago that I've read it, but that it's something about how the chromosomes and DNA and the, the language uh, lends itself to that. So if you're interested in it, look it up. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm um, I don't need the scientific miracles to believe in the Quran. You know, I know it's the truth without the scientific miracles, so I don't pay a lot of attention to it. Um, but I know that, you know, some people, it, it matters a lot to them. Um, so I'm sure you can find it if, if you just look up scientific miracles of Surah Tariq, you'll probably find it. But loyans and, and uh, uh, the... Pelvic arc is is very reasonable, but my point is that the traditional tafsir, you if you're reading the direct the direct Arabic, you'll be confused a bit by finding all this material about um, whether a child is born from a woman's chest area, whether the the ribs of a woman play a role. All of that is is. All of that is old. Um, they don't necessarily set this narrative because they believe in it, but because they are setting all the different possibilities that words could have. And um, but in terms of understanding what Surah Tariq could say. It would be very reasonable to say that Sulbo Tara means that it's created from loins and, and the pelvic arc. Again, the point is if, a, if God can turn this fluid into a living being and what is seemingly coming from nothing to something, then why are you surprised that God can also bring this human being back to life? This is particularly in response to the old Arab belief that once, that they, even if they believed in God, they did not believe that God was capable of bringing people back to life. And so that would be a direct response to this and saying, you know, Think of the miracle of life itself, and you'll know that resurrection is not a stretch. Yawma tubla sara'ir, the day when secrets are revealed. There is a hadith to, uh, attributed to the Prophet, the Prophet is asked about what the meaning of tubla sara'ir, and the Prophet says, well, there are people that say we've prayed, but they we pray, but they don't pray. There are people who say we fast, but they, we don't fast, and people who say that we give zakah, but they don't. Um, these people are going to be confronted with their lies in the hereafter, and of course that becomes central in the traditional tafsir narrative. فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ وَلَا نَاصِرٍ And in that day, human being stands without external support. In other words, they're not going to be able to get away from accountability and from having to answer their, to, uh, their own 
uh, um, answer the answer to their lies. Um, another thing about Tubla Sarai that I should mention, um, it was in the traditional tafsir and and especially among the early Muslims, it was understood that this yet again was an emphasis on honesty in dealing. So you have these very interesting reports. Uh, for instance, um, one of the narratives goes that a, a man goes to a sheep herder, a kid, a, a boy who was herding sheep, and he said, you know, give me one of these sheep and and claim, tell your owner that it was lost and I'll give you half the price and you can pocket that money. And so the, the sheep herder reportedly, the, the boy, young boy, told the man, well, yes, I can fool my owner, but what am I going to tell Allah yawma tubla sara'ir? Quoting Surah Tariq. And the man was so struck by the response of the of that kid that he swore he, from that day on he swore that he will never lie or cheat. So point is that this was part of an ethic that taught to early Muslims an ethic of honesty in treatment in dealing uh, in older affairs. Okay. والسماء ذات الرجع والأرض ذات الصدع والسماء ذات الرجع the heavens that resurges the سماء that resurges and the traditional tafsir said this has to be a reference to rain and how the water evaporates from all over, it forms into clouds and then it falls into rain. While only that the Raja, the Pharaoh Earth, and then the miracle of the earth receiving this water and it cracks open so that plants can grow. And that again that Allah is saying, you know, reflect for the earth to retain its water and for there to be a process, an intricate process of evaporation and cloud formation and rainfall and the, the entire dynamic of how seeds break through the earth. Al-Ard uh, al-Sata means the, the cracking earth, the earth that cracks in response. Uh, this cannot be coincidence that all of this needs, again, an intelligent maker behind it. That this is that this is a decisive message. Decisive meaning false means separates false from truth. Darkness from light. It is not a message to be taken lightly. It is not something that you can consider as uh, marginal or ancillary. First, it is what everything is about. And then this most fascinating promise to the Meccans in the from the traditional again perspective that they are scheming and plotting meaning that they oppose you Muhammad and are scheming to persecute you Muslims but know that God has his own plans don't worry. It, 
it is in Allah's control. You can imagine the response of the Meccans as you would hear, as they would hear, at that time that Surah Tariq was revealed, you know, this man who has a few followers who are mostly persecuted is telling them, you are, um, you are scheming and God is scheming and just wait and see. That must have sounded like completely absurd to them. Absolutely ridiculous. And in fact, we do have reports that when they heard this, they, they mocked it. They, they laughed and said, you're telling us that wait and see? Um, and of course, in hindsight, we know what happens. We know that, you know, after five or six years, that they're going to migrate to Medina, and then they're going to be the Battle of Badr, and they're going to win that battle, and so on and so forth. But this is still in the future. And... It, now, in traditional tafsir, tafsir there is the issue of when Allah says they scheme and Allah schemes, is this a promise limited to the Prophet والسلام, or this is something that can, take, can be taken um, as a message to Muslims across the ages? And Ibn Taymiyyah and people like Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim Juzayh and, and um, they said no, it's a message to Muslims across the ages that, but as long as they are real Muslims, um, true to the message. And that Allah is doing what we hear repeatedly in the Quran is that if you are with Allah, Allah is with you. And that regardless of what happens short term, you must have absolute confidence that when Allah wills, things will change and change in very dramatic ways. Okay. So that's a traditional approach to Surah Tar, which is pretty straightforward, I think, and invokes very common themes, um, but important ones, nevertheless. Okay, let, let's take a three-minute break, and then we'll start the second approach. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Sufi-esque approach is next. Isn't the traditional is kind of fun? Too boring. No, it's because you're used to the incredible. Yeah, we're used to the The new ideas. So, the some of the most um, beautiful language in our tradition was generated in commenting on Surah Tariq. And because of that, I'm going to read some of the, the Arabic and then paraphrase it. But just so the those who do know Arabic would get a sense of um, the inspiration that Surah Tariq had. So we start out with the same, with the same foundation that the Prophet ﷺ counseled strongly to reflect upon Surah Tariq and that you don't uh, just pass um, without reflection. And From that, the Sufi-esque tafsir, often this is sort of the, the point of demarcation, the point of um, where they start. And then they go on from there. 
And what's fascinating is that they, so they, then they say, well, what does it mean to reflect upon the heavens? Um, and some of the, the language here is وَلَا يَتَوَهَّمْنَ أَحَدْ أَنَّ مَعْنَ النَّظَرِ إِلَىٰ عَالَمْ مَلَكُوتِ السَّمَاءِ بَأَنْ يَمْتَدُّ النَّظَرِ إِلَيْهِ فَيَرَى ظُرْقَةِ السَّمَاءِ وَضَوْءِ الْكَوَاكِبِ وَصُوَرُ الْبُرُوجِ وَأَنْتَ غَافِلٌ عَنْ نَفْسَكُ وَعَنْ حِفْظَكُ وَعَنْ, وعن حِفَظَكُ وتحسب أنك خلق للأكل والشرب والجماع كالبهائم ولا تتفكر في خلقك. So I, I think this is um, I think this is from Jilani or it might be from Shirazi. I'm not sure. I, I didn't write down where I copied it from. As I said, these notes are often very old. They go back a while. But anyway, so that don't. It, it, if you're just staring at the the sky and you are noticing um, planets and your stars and and lights, um, well, that's not the point. Because you could gaze upon the heavens and see all all the planetary configurations. But if it doesn't lend, lead into an insight inside the self, then it is pointless. And the part of the language that, I, uh, that I've read, and they often point to the fact that the, the, the frequent problem with human beings is that they imagine too quickly, or that they often forget and start imagining that they've been created just so they can eat and drink and copulate, uh, just like Baha'im or like animals, without reflecting within the self and understanding the purpose of their existence. And the universe within the self. Okay, so... وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقُ In Sufi Ask Tafsir, all Quranic references to Sama are also references to the within. And it comes from that you gaze upwards but you gaze upwards not for uh, its own sake, but you gaze upwards in order to gaze within. And that the more that you gaze upwards and you open yourself to true understanding, uh, you also see what is inside of you. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقِ The heavens and that that comes to it as a tariq, as an event. Not just an event, but as an event that opens up something, that allows something to unfold. And then Asks rhetorically, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الطَّارِقِ And what, and do you know what the tariq is? That Allah is alerting us to the importance of the concept of a tariq. Not simply to a particular star in the heavens, but to the, to the tariq as a concept. And a tariq as a concept then unfolds into an najm al the revealing or piercing star. And what is a piercing star? So here's an example of 
some of the language which I was alluding to. You say, وفي إشارة إلى كوكب اسم الجمال الثاقب الطارق وكوكب اسم الجلال وقال القاشاني أي الروح الإنساني والعقل الذي يظهر في ظلمة النفس وهو النجم الذي يثقب ظلمتها وينفس فيها ويبصر بنوره ويهتدي به كما قال إلخ إلخ This is from um, Ismail Haqqi, I believe. Then elsewhere, and I think this is from Shirazi, he says, والنجم الثاقب أي الجذب المضيء الأحدية اللامعة المتشعشعة الناشئة من عالم العماء الذي هو محل كمال الجلاء والإنجلاء الذاتي والجزوة المشتعلة الساقطة من نار العشق والمحبة المفرطة الإلهية إلى شجرة الناسوت القائلة لك بعدما أمرك بالانخلاع عن كسوة الناسوت إني أنا ربك فخلعنا عليك إنك بالوادي المقدس طوى. So these two samples, and I'm gonna read some others. What they're saying is, so a Najm al-Thaqib is an event, and what is the event that is inside of you? You we learn from the heavens that Allah can send events of illumination. Well, what is the event inside of you that resembles what you see in the heavens? And the piercing star within, there are, within the Sufi-esque tradition, those like Jilani and Kashani and a few others that said that it is the intellect. The intellect is the locus of what allows you to understand enlightenment. That within you, the human soul is as if is in a state of darkness that resembles the darkness of the heavens. You look up and there's just absolute darkness. But what pierces through this darkness are events aided by the divine. The intellect, when it understands its relationship to divinity, illuminates through this darkness and becomes a Najm al -thaqib. The second perspective, which is very close, except that it said it is not simply the intellect and the illuminations of understanding, but it is the passion of love that is ignited within. Without love, you remain in a state of darkness. And in fact, some went even beyond that and said that well, of course, they, they have these long discussions about false love and real love. But anyway, that if you have, if you don't know true love, if you haven't learned how to love, and they say that even first, that you learn how to love, if you love truly a partner, or a mother, or a father, or a child, or a parent, but it has to be real love not love based on self-promotion and self-interest, not, so, not an egocentric love, but a giving love, a love like we talked about um, in Surah Maryam. 
the the paradigm of, of of real love. That without that, then light doesn't shine within the darkness inside the self. And from that love, you grow into divine love. That if you, and that is why, when the we have all the traditions that say that if you don't know how to love human beings, you don't know how to love God. Because it's the same, it's like the training wheels for how to love God. If, if your love towards human beings, towards nature, towards creation, is a selfish love, an egocentric love, a destructive love, then you will love God in the same way. And you will turn God into a tool or a weapon to dominate others or to beat others or to persecute others or to torment others. But if you understand what real love is, then... When you love God, it doesn't become about persecuting others. It becomes about sharing divinity with others, spreading divinity to others. Musharakat al bashar al sifat al ilahiyya that you 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 understand the qualities of divinity, the qualities of God, godliness. And your love, then you become like a medium for the sharing of divine love with others. So, you have... The, the orientation that says God is telling you work on the intellect so that the intellect can understand its relationship to divinity while a close ally to that orientation is yes but not just the intellect so and understand its relationship to divinity but the the, the intellect is in harmony with the qalb, with the heart, which is the locus, so that you are, light will not shine unless you, you grow into a state of love. Okay. So in the kullu nafsin lamma alayha hafiz. So here then you have a hafiz. But what is this hafiz? In the Sufi ask orientation, perhaps among um, I want to share with you. Okay, so it says, this is from uh, Sadr al-Muta'allihin al-Shirazi. Um, Shirazi, of course, is one of the luminaries of Islamic philosophy and Sufism, um, Persian, one of, an extremely, one of the most profound intellects probably that humanity has ever known. So, so the, uh, he says, وَلِلنُفُوسِ well, الْإِنسَانِيَّةِ رَقِيبُ وَاحِدْ عَقْلِ يُسَمَّى بِرُوحِ القدس عِنْدَ أَهْلِ الشَّرْحِ وَبِالْعَقْلِ الْفَعَالِ عِنْدَ الْحُكَمَاءِ وَبِرِوَانِ بَخْشِ عِنْدَ الْحُكَمَاءِ عند الحكماء الْفَارِسِيِّينَ فَإِنْ قِيلْ إِنْ حَمَلَتْ إِنَّ ذَنِ He goes into a little bit of a grammar. Yeah. Uh, so when we the Surah Al-Mujamakuliyah in the first place on the 
ولكن كل نفس رقيب خاص وهو ملك يحفظ عملها ويحصي عليها ما تكسب وللنفوس الانسانيه رقيب واحد عقلي يسمى بروح القدس. اوكي. So then what he's saying is that the hafiz, yes, Allah is a hafiz. Yes, there are angels that are keeping track of what you do. But the hafiz that is specifically referenced here is He says for, for people of Shara, they call it Ruh quds or the Holy Ghost. Um, for people of philosophy, they call it Al-Aql Al-Fa'al, and I'll talk about that in a second. The active intellect. And he says that in Persian, uh, they call it Ruan Bakhsh. Uh, this is classical Persian, obviously. Um, that... So what what is that? And and here where the the Sufi esque approach gets um, a bit intense. So bear with me a little bit. So they argued that. Human intellects, or sorry, intellects in creation, are of four stages. Al aql al hiyulani, al hiyulani, al hiyulani, is basically the intellect that is simply capable of simple perception. Nothing more than simple perception. العقل الملكي or عقل الملكة it's an intellect that is capable of consciousness so it has a sense of the self it can perceive the self العقل الفعلي or عقل الفعل is the intellect that can understand obligation. They say it's manatu taklif, meaning it's the that is what makes human beings obligated. So most animals never go beyond al aql al hulani, simple perception. They have no sense of the self. Some animals do, like maybe dolphins, I guess, or whales. I, I don't know, I'm not sure. But animals don't have al aql al fa'al because they are they, they, they don't understand obligation. Then beyond that, al aql al mustafad is the intellect beyond understanding obligation, you are actually learn from your empirical experiences. So that's the analytical intellect. And they argued that, well, when Allah says, إِنَّ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ لَمَّعَ عَلَيْهَا حَافِظٍ That guardian is how, a, how developed your intellect is and what you invest in that intellect so that it can go from a simple intellect that thinks in terms of my desires and needs to an intellect that can understand its obligations and duties to an intellect that can actually attain wisdom from learned experiences. Now, why is this important? Well, because they argued that most people who believe they love, they love with a very primitive intellect. 
They love with an intellect of needs and desires. What I want and what I desire. Give me this, don't give me that. This makes me happy, it doesn't make me happy. And so their love towards human beings and their love towards God is skewed. And when Allah says, Inna kullu nafsin lamma alayha hafiz, and, and I, I'm, I'm skipping the grammatical debate over lamma and lamma. There, there's a debate about whether it's lamma or lamma. But we don't need it. Because I, you already have enough, as, as I'm sure, as it is. <laughs> Unless you insist on me going through the grammatical debate, then I'll do it. You know, I'm happy to do it. But the... So, this is why, this is the rub. This is why it's important. Is that it is not just that you are developing your intellect, but it is what type of intellect are you using to construct, a, to build your understanding of love. So, some of you could say, well, I, you know, I keep trying to love Allah. Well, do you love Allah with what intellect? Do you love Allah with the intellect that al-aql al-malaki, that the intellect that just understands desires and impulses? Give me, Allah, give me, Allah, you know, please, Allah, give me this, Allah, give me more money, give me this, give me that, give me that. Or do you love in the, Allah with an intellect? that actually understands the self and so is not anchored in the primitiveness of self-indulgence. Everyone follow me? Okay. I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm like simplifying all these, like if, if you want a sample for how the, the, the philosophical articulation just for the Arabic readers, here's a, a quick sample so just so you know how much I'm, I'm, I'm streamlining. Um, so, just so the Arabic readers can get a sense. Um, we call, uh, وهنا وجه آخر هو أن الإنسان لما كان عالما صغيرا فيه جميع ما في العالم فلا يبعد أن يراد بقوله والسماء ذات الرجع الدماغ وما فيه من قوى المدركة والمتصرفة وما يحصل له من الأحوال المذكرة والإلهامات والعلوم الراجعة المتكررة وإن شئت وإن شئ خصصت الرجوع بالقوة المذكرة ويقال لها المسترجعة ومحلها التجويف المؤخر لخ إلخ ثم يقول وبعضها فيكون إشارة إلى المرتبة الأولى للاستعداد وهو العقل الهيولاني الذي هو أول مراتب النفس القابلة للمعاني الكلية وبعضها يكون تلوحا إلى ثاني مراتبها المسمى بالعقل بالملكة الحاصل باستعمال الحواس وحصول الأولويات وهو مناط التكليف وبعضها يكون إيماء إلى المرتبة الثالثة ويسمى بالعقل الفعال أو الفاعل عند تحصيل النظريات لها بمعنى أنها ما تشاءت والتفتت إليها حصلتها بلا كسب وتعمل وبعضها يكون إشارة المرتبة الرابعة ويحصول العلوم الكلية والحقائق العقلية لها مشاهدة ويسمى العقل المستفاد المضيع في دار المعاد then it goes on so the Arabic the Arabic people you follow this yeah. it, it, so it gets it, you know, it, it gets the point is that it gets very extensive Okay, so now, but there is another point in the Sufi-esque approach. So remember, we, we did the traditional approach, now we're doing the Sufi-esque approach. Um, so all of this was Sama'a wa Tariq wa Ma'adraka wa Ma'adraka wa Ma'adraka wa Ma'adraka wa Inna kullu nafsin lama or lama alayha hafiz. What is your guardian? And the Sufi ask, it's either the heart or the mind, the heart in the sense of love or the intellect in the sense of enlightenment. Okay. 
فلينظر الانسان الانسان مما خلق فلينظر الانسان مما خلق خلق من ماء دافق يخرج من بين الصلب والطرائب so human beings created from fluid that flows from الصلب والطرائب Most Sufi ask tafsir say a sulbu taraib is loins and pelvic cavity like the traditional. Except some Sufis said that a sulbu taraib, that you, human beings are created from a mixture of primordial stages of knowledge. And, and I, you know, I'm, if I'm losing some of you, please forgive me. I, you know, I just teach this stuff. I don't, you know. Okay. Primordial, stage, primordial stages of knowledge and from more temporal and contingent impulses. What does this mean? That you as a human being, when Allah creates you, Allah inputs in you knowledge of things that are of nature necessarily through. So in other words, your desire for justice, even an animal has a sense of that. So if you have two dogs, you give one dog a treat, the other dog looks at you like, where's my treat? A primordial sense of justice. You can't give that dog a treat and me not a treat. For a dog, it's its basic sense of the self. For a human being, it's more developed than that. So you, a basic, a basic sense of sometimes we need mercy. So yeah, this would be just, so like for instance, when you think, you look at your father or punishing your brother or sister and say, oh, this is too much. Okay, yeah, my brother did something wrong, but it wasn't this bad. Primordial knowledge, this deep sense of right and wrong that Allah instills in you, but a mixture also of things that are reactive to contingencies. So, for instance, your sense of modesty or your understanding of language. What's offensive, what's not offensive? That is not formed by any things that are primordial in you, but by experiences. So you could grow in one culture and, you know, I'll give you a uh, an example that I just read yesterday again, uh, sort of chuckled at because it reminded me. In in some cultures, you see two men walking, you know, arm in arm. Oh, nothing. My when my father came in New York, he, he was like took my brother's arm and like would want to walk him arm in arm like they do in Egypt. And my brother like said, no 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 they're gonna think we're gay, you know, <laughs> you know it's. This was back in the 80s, so, you know, and we had just arrived in the United States. So we're learning. Anyway, uh, another thing, um, I had a visitor from back home. Back home is no big deal. I mean, I, I don't want to be, t t but back home when I mean like in, in, in the villages, uh, it's no big deal if you spit in the, in the, in the you know, you, you just spit. No big deal. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, in the streets of LA, in especially in um, you know in in the nicer parts of LA, it is a big deal. You can't go around spinning; people look at you. Uh, yeah. So that's the point: is that you are created from a mixture of both, and the intellect must understand what is primordial within you and what is contingent and evolving and a product of a deontology, if you want the fancy word, 
that a product of morality that is subject to time and place. Okay, then in now ala raj'ihi la qadr yawma tubla sara'ir. Okay, so Sufi asked the Fsirs, understand this, okay, that Allah can bring human backs, human beings back the day when sara'ir, the the secrets of the souls are revealed. Everything is revealed, including the the authenticity or lack of authenticity of of your approach. Um, okay, so we get and there is no aid and no helper except in in, in that day. Where it gets really interesting for the Sufi Tafsirs is was Sama is that the Raja al Ard that the Sada. Because remember, in the traditional it's rain and plantation, right? In the Sufi Tafsirs, they say no. Was Sama is that the Raja al Ard that the Sada is a reference to as Sama is always a reference to the the, the self. Up in the sky and you know up above and below both. What under that of Sada is the self and the heart or the soul. I think uh, the dogs know we're talking about what we're going to talk about, and you're going to actually it's going to freak you out that the dogs are howling because they say that. There are there are three um, um, they're really howling. <laughs> uh, I think they they probably sense gin. Oh my god! <laughs> Bye. The the I, I pulled the 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 thing because I want to see if I um, if I should share with you some of the uh, text. Um, no, it's too long. Okay, so so say that there are what Allah is alerting you to is that there are um, there is the jism, the body. There is the nafs, the self, and there is the ruh, the spirit. The body is the domain of the dunya, and it tends to overwhelm the self and the spirit, and nafs wa ruh. The role of the body ends with death. After death begins a new stage, and that's the stage of al barzakh And in the stage of al barzakh the uh, there is no translation for the barzakh other than um, the in between. The in between, or the, there is a word. Um, is it purgatory. Limbo. Oh, yeah, Maybe limbo. limbo. So, like, there's a word, uh, no, there's a, there's a word from... Oh, down. Down. Anyway. Oh, wait, wait. I took the in-between from a horror movie. What? <laughs> Someone said, the chat is down. Oh. Liminal? Liminal. Um, liminal? Oh, liminal is good. Oh. I like that. Okay. <laughs> um... In the Barzakh, this is the domain of the nafs, the self. There is 
in the Barzakh, the self, but there is no jism, there is no body, and the ruh is constrained and still submerged. And then the ruh, its domain is in al-akhira, in the hereafter. I'm skipping over the evidence that they cite for this because then we'll, this, this halqa will be extremely long. But, so, in, on this earth, it's the body that tends to overwhelm the nafs and the ruh, the, the self and the spirit. In the barzakh, after death and before the hereafter, in this in-between liminal state, this in-between state, there is a continued consciousness, but that consciousness uh, is, and, and I'll ex explain an, an, another thing. In the barzakh, time passes very differently, differently than earth. So in the barzakh, A thousand years is equal, as the Quran says, to one year on earth. And in the hereafter, after, 50,000 years is equal to one year on earth. So, or, or the, the vice versa. So in other words, if you, in God's time, the, the Prophet just died a minute ago. In the hereafter, after. In the Barzakh, the prophet just, you know, died a year ago because it's a thousand. To, so in the state of the barzakh, the self is in a different state of consciousness and it is aware whether it is in purgatory or in a state of bliss. And then the hereafter is a completely, complete different transformation and that's the rawh. So why do they emphasize this? Because when Allah says that the when Allah says the heavens and Allah is saying and the self as it will return and well, or that is sada and the heart and what it can understand of what it can understand of the role of the body and the role of the self and the role of the spirit. So, in other words, is your heart going to understand that these three layers and the fact that you are your body is falsely dominant on this earth but it is only in one stage because in the two other stages this body is going to be very subservient and play a very subservient role so what is the challenge the challenge is that on this earth you elevate the self and the soul so that the body is no longer as dominant the more you do that, the easier to transition. Okay. And then... I'm, I'm just, I don't know why. Something is telling me, read a quote. Um, okay. So it says, Alam. اعلم أن الله خلق الوجود ثلاث عوالم دنيا وبرزخا وأخرى ويعبر عن كل منهما بيوم فكل يوم من أيام الدنيا مدة دورة الفلك الأعظم وربما يطلق على زمان دورة القمر بل على زمان دورة الشمس أيضا ومجموعة سبعة ألاف ومجموعها سبعة ألاف سنة وكل يوم من أيام البرزخ ألف سنة مما تعدون أو سبعة ألاف سنة مما تعدون وكل يوم من أيام الآخرة وهي أيام الله يكون خمسين ألف سنة تعرج الملائكة والروح إليه في يوم كان مقدارهم خمسين ألف سنة من سورة المعارج فخلق الله الجسم عن الدنيا والنفس عن البرزخ والروح عن الآخرة وجعل الوسائط الحاكمة الناقلة لتنوعات عوالم الإنسان ثلاثة ملك الموت ونفخة الفزع ونفخة الصاق فالموت للأجسام والفزع للنفوس والصاق للأرواح 
فإذا كان الإنسان في هذا الدار إلى إلى so that's the quote that I just wanted to get on record. It gives an illustration of this type of narrative. Okay. Um, إنهم يكيدون كيدا وأكيد كيدا فمهل الكافرين أمهلهم رويدا. So now, when Allah says they are they scheme and Allah schemes, so give respite to the unbelievers. In the Sufi esk tafsir, the scheming. The, the scheming that Allah is talking about is not um, plotting and planning. That they think that they are managing their affairs meaningfully and effectively. But in fact, they are oblivious to the roles that the body and the self and the soul play. And that in due time, the body will have no role and it will all be about the self, mere consciousness. And then in due time, it's all going to be about the soul. And the body will play an entirely subservient role because it will simply be a witness. And the self will be completely obliterated because the ego in the hereafter is obliterated, the consciousness, and it's all going to be about the soul. That, that is what Allah says, wait for. That's the Sufi school of thought. All of that from Surah Tariq. And I've skipped a lot, believe me. <laughs> Um, okay, so I've told you now my approach, um, which of course was the you know, with a, a tradition this rich, you you're you're ashamed to to even offer anything. Um, but what I call, what, what I'm saying is, is my approach is that I focus on the role that Surah Tariq itself played when it was revealed and how it was understood. And so let, let's go back something that we all agree on, the, the traditional, the Sufi-esque and, and mine, that Allah alerts us to look unto the heavens. We know that the heavens is dark unless Allah penetrates the dark, that darkness with light. And that Allah alerts our gaze to the piercing star or the piercing source of enlightenment. And of course, it makes perfect sense that this piercing source of enlightenment is the intellect and the piercing source of light is understanding of love and the, the, to develop the ability to love. But what was the light that the Prophet and the companions at the time of the Prophet perceived as coming to them. And especially the light vis-a-vis -vis what was going on in Mecca at the time. What was that piercing light? And in the years of research, and I've talked about methodology many times, so we don't need to go over it, but the, the years of research and prayer on Surah al tariq the age of enlightenment that Muslims were being promised was an age in which the oppression of the exploitative classes of society were going to be challenged. 
which was the age of the rise of al-mustadafun fil ard the the oppressed in the land many of the converts to islam at that time understood the islamic message as a message in, in fact, in, in, in one of the narratives about Surah Tariq is that, and it's a very interesting narrative because it says that Abu, ba Abu Bakr al-Siddiq understands from Surah Tariq that he should go and liberate slaves that were being tortured. Why did he understand from Surah Tariq that he should go and purchase liber and slaves that were being tortured? I think that the enlightenment that they understood as coming was a form of social empowerment against the spoiled elite of Mecca. And that well, on every time that, especially in the early Meccan surahs, when Allah refers Muslims to reflect upon the state of nature, Allah is also inviting them to reflect upon the egalitarianism in the mechanics of creation itself. The fact that Allah doesn't send the rain solely for the rich, and Allah doesn't allow vegetation to grow solely for the rich, but in fact that, and even there is a very interesting report um, that I found in Akhbar al-Qudah of, of, of all places, which says, It says that the oppressed on the, in the earth will emerge from the land oppressed from the earth will emerge from the land, that it's, look at the bounties that Allah send so that society will grumble enough so that the oppressed will emerge from the land. And then when Allah says, إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدَ وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدَ I understand that, that if you understand that the purpose of this message is this form of liberation, then Allah is with you. And then the entire meaning of this scheme and Allah's schemes becomes very different. Empowerment will be for the dispossessed. If they, if they understand that this battle must be fought with the divine, hand in hand, not in lieu of the divine or by or in ignoring the divine, that's why I think Surah Tariq, before it became one of the most remarkable things that I found about Surah Tariq, well, we know that well, there, there are many traditions about when it was recited. So there are traditions that the Prophet ﷺ would like to, very much like to recite it after Maghrib in, in Sunnah prayers. He would recite Surah Tariq and, um, and another surah, I don't remember. And there was a, a, another uh, report that Mu'az and in prayer recited in one rak'ah, Surah Al-Baqarah, and another rak'ah, Surah Al-Nisa'ah. Do you know how long that would be? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Afattanun ya Mu'az, you know, this is too much Mu'az. Why didn't you just recite Surah al Surah Tariq? That's another point. But there is another report that Muslims would, before Battle of Uhud, kept reciting Surah Tariq. And when I researched this report and I prayed on this report, I couldn't get away from the feeling that the early Muslims understood Surah Tariq 
as a surah of in, in, in calling upon these mustadafin, those oppressed in the land, to tell them a new age is going to shine. If you understand that this is what Allah wants from you, to challenge the corrupt power structures that exist. So now you have it. The traditional approach, the Sufi approach, and my approach, I think all approaches are correct. So whichever you want, there is no bad. Except some will reject my approach, I'm sure, but they're wrong. <laughs> Okay, alhamdulillah, tammat surah tarq. Okay, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. No, you are. Thank you so much. For, these are my favorite ones when you do the three version, when you go through traditional, Sufi-esque, and then yours. It's just, it's like three halakhas in one. It's so awesome. Um, although I was complaining that the traditional is too boring, so sorry about that. <laughs> Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. Did she stutter? Can't nope. say that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it just okay. Sorry. <laughs> I've heard the traditional ones so often that it's exciting to hear, like you know, the breadth of knowledge and the different ways that it can go, and the extent of imagination and intellect, and just you know, the tradition, the richness of the tradition that you normally don't get exposed to. I'm, so it's I'm, just very exciting. I'm kidding. Me. You're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> You're entitled no, to your opinion. Okay. No, that's okay. Don't but, feel bad. Um, but I actually, but if I could just ask for a clarification, because a couple of us got a little bit confused when you got into the part about, um, like, the different um, body, self. body self and all of that. Like, which were the verses that those ones arose from? Um, yeah. Thank you, I mean. Um, this is when the, the, the this discussion comes up when um, the 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 verse يوم تبلى السرائر إن نعل رج على رجعه لقادر يوم تبلى السرائر فما لهم قوة ولا ناصر والسماء ذات الرجع والأرض ذات الصدع. So the, these are particularly when we get to um, um, when the, say, the days that the secrets are revealed or tested, where and then we say the and the resurgent sky and the formed earth, and so the in the Sufi esque approach. They say, okay, what, what is going to, it's an elaboration upon what is going to be tested. And when you talk about the resurgent sky, um, uh, they don't see it as rain, but um, um, The um, the attempts of the soul and the self to to overcome the limitations of the body on this earth and the furrowed earth, the furrowed earth or the cracking earth as a reference to the human heart as a is receiving the, as it's supporting or uh, propelling the efforts of the soul and the, the self to get beyond the limitations of the body. And then this is the point where they usually talk about, well, you know, there there's the, the body is what is extinguished and upon death, but the self continues on in the barzakh, and then the self is extinguished in the hereafter, uh, but the soul is what continues on in the hereafter. And then, of course, God brings back the body and the self in some form, but there are, they, are, they don't play a, 
a dominant role anymore. So the reference to the resurgent heaven is understood in the Sufi-esque approach as a god is, is swearing by the determined the, the determined intellect that wishes to liberate the soul and the self from the limitations of the body and life on this earth. Um, Sorry, <clears throat> can, can you um, explain the distinction then between self and spirit or self and soul? Self is basically the consciousness and the ego. Um, that's the nafs. And the soul is, is the divine substance. It, it is the, the, the life that is directly comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the self is, in, in its most basic form, is consciousness, but in um, it quickly descends into a form of ego. And uh, there's actually, um, there's part that I, um, maybe, actually, I hope, since you've asked, where's, where's my notebook? No, the other one. Okay, here it is. So, there's this sort of, um, especially in the Sufi esthetician, it says, um, It says, I think I wrote it down somewhere. So, yeah, I, I didn't want to quote it, somebody wrote the idea. So it's basically that uh, they even say that in the, the self um, is not the soul and it's not the body. So the self is, is, is like a, a, a hologramic, in, in the state of Barzakh, it's a hologramic thing. So... Some Sufis even argue that the, the self in the state of Barzakh, uh, it is, if your self image is, if, if your self is bad, in the state of Barzakh, you are not even necessarily going to be human at all. You might be a demon. Um, um, you might be something completely dark and foul smelling um, and if you if you know enough about the paranormal world that's actually not far off uh, evil people when their souls are stuck somewhere they emit a smell that like rotten meat and um, they appear like dark shadows or demonic figures um, while if your if your if your self is clean, you are like a luminous substance. So you appear in the barzakh as a luminous substance. If Allah allows you to appear, that is, uh, you can take human form, but you appear like a holograph. You're not you're not going to have an actual physical form. The soul is is something else. The soul is a secret from God, because it's divine. So Allah says, you know, they ask you about the soul, tell them that the soul is a secret from God. Only God knows what is the truth about the soul. So that's basically the idea. Was if there you want, a I, lot more that you held back from us? That... <laughs> well, what I've held back is um, there, there is a long passage that explains how um, um, the 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 self that um, it, 
that the life you lead on this earth actively constructs the self that is struck in the barzakh. And, um, and then there are some very scary language about what that self could be if you are not careful. So it's basically in the barzakh you, the, the, you don't have the divine intervention that allows you to filter the truth of the self through the body. Because when we have our bodies, in the Sufi perspective at least, you have your body, uh, the body filters the truth of the self, but, but in the following way. So if the, if the self is very luminous, it will reflect upon the body. People will look at you and they will say, this is a beautiful human being. But if your self is very ugly, the body could actually filter it and conceal the ugliness of the self, unless you have luminous insight. Um, and the body will also conceal the ugliness of the self from you, unless you stare it very deeply within. Um, but that filter is gone in the barzakh. And all you have is the truth of the self. And when you confront the truth of the self in the barzakh, you might be terrified because it might dawn on you, oh my God, I'm heading to hell. Uh, or you might be very happy and say, you know, my self is, is, is very luminous and that bears, that's good news for me in the hereafter. Um, so I skip this, this because this is a long passage and it's just, you know, it goes on for pages and pages talking about that. Sorry, and last thing, you, you went through a long quote, you said you had to insert it, and then you just read it in Arabic, but you didn't translate it into English. Did you just want uh, that to be... Yeah, honest? just just for the Arabic speakers. I didn't want to paraphrase it. It's too hard. Okay. <laughs> That's discrimination. That is, yes. It is discrimination, <laughs> but it's hard. It, Are it's we being a, multilingual elitist right now, Shane? <laughs> yes, what does this, what yes, does this surah teach us about elitism? <laughs> yes, but but you know, it's it's elitism co that comes from the lack of abilities, not the elitism that comes from uh, being. I think we very, all know you have the ability. <laughs> it, it's just too hard to translate some stuff. Okay, so we just leave it there for history? Yeah, just, just leave it for history. No, he said he has the ability to translate it. It's too hard. It's too hard. It's I vote for you to translate it. Oh my <laughs> god, Rick. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Give us a halakha. That can be your question. The, 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 it's, the, the, it, if I'm too lazy, it's just a lot of hard work. Okay, we'll get one of the students to translate for us after. Yeah, yeah, um, the, 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 you know, people don't know that you're always after me uh, to, to spell out everything. Yeah. She never lets me get away with anything. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I hide what I read from you. <laughs> you know, that's why I don't tell you. That's why I don't tell you about the good stuff that I read. Because I know you'll never let me get away with it. Oh. Have, someone has to stand up for the oppressed who don't mm. speak Arabic. Yeah, I know. There's no <laughs> okay. The piercing star. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you're just discriminating. Only the Arabic speakers will be in heaven. That's not fair. Mm. Oh. Okay. She's really going. <laughs> okay. I've, I've asked enough questions. Maybe I'll ask you later. Okay. Anyone else? God, like someone save me from her. <laughs> Can I stay with someone with you guys tonight? We yeah, have an additional kanafa on me. Oh, cool. She has kanafa. I'm, I'm staying with you. Kanafa? Goodbye. Oh, my gosh. I have ice cream. Okay. Questions? Anybody? Come on. My question is just about the, the two passages that you quoted. One was about the four stages of the intellect. And then the one that the ruh and the nafs, just the source for those, because I, I think I saw you reading them on the on the different. Apps. The, um, I if the four stages of the intellect that was a, um, a Shirazi, um, Sadr al Mutaalihin. Is that Mullah Sutra? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
The uh, other one was what? The passage that Grace is asking about. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, <laughs> I thought he said Jigani al Kasha. It's not a Sutra of Tasdik. He has parts. It's not a part. His, his uh, Mullah Sadr's tafsir on uh, Surah Al-Tariq is very long. Um, he really takes off on Surah Al-Tariq. Um, the passage that Grace was asking about that I didn't want to, was too lazy to, to translate, <laughs> is... That's Rami volunteering to translate it. Oh, there we go. Rami. Yeah, Rami. So, uh, uh, Rami can translate if you guys want. Hey. But you have to bribe him for something, because I don't know why he would do it. Yeah. We'll give him one of your books. Not my books. <laughs> but, um, Jirani. That was for verses 11 and 12. It's Sama'i that the Raja of Arzat Okay, hold on. Yeah, I think it's Sama'i that Sadiq Hassan Khan. It's not Jirani? No. Sadiq Hassan Khan. Okay, does anybody else have a question? Yeah, I do. Okay, come on. Get out. I'll, I'll check my, my notes downstairs to make sure, but because I, I can't find it, um, I didn't write the source. Ready? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think it's, this is a two-part question. As I started to, when you got to your approach to it, because of a lot of the, the, the last few weeks, a lot of the discussion on the YouTube live stream doesn't make its way into here, and we don't get to a lot of their questions. Um, and a lot of the discussion has been centered around people who have been through extreme abuse and trauma in their childhood yeah. and, and dealing with it once, they're, once they reach adulthood. So I, I saw, I mean, you could, that same idea of the, 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 the piercing star is coming and that you're going to challenge the oppressive regime could be applied to someone who's going through severe abuse because you know I, I think that that's a lot of the dynamic is you wonder why how, how could something like this happen to me and wondering if there if mm -hmm. there's hope especially if you're a child who goes through that for a majority of 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 their childhood and are dealing with the ramifications as an adult and the second question or the second part of it is what would you tell somebody who, who after going through, I mean, I'm talking about severe abuse, is struggling with loving God, does it, like affirmatively does not love God and is, is angry because, you know, of, of what they went through. What's the advice that you would give to them? Sorry. <coughs> Are you, uh, when we talk about severe abuse, uh, are, are we talking about including sexual abuse? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> the hardest, the hardest thing to deal with, even harder than physical abuse, is sexual abuse. Um, because sexual abuse, um, divorces a human being from, them, from their body. 
and especially consistent and persistent sexual abuse. And um, it, it makes them um, um, often, um, instead of defiant or was maybe even an, an overreaction of uh, defensiveness towards the world, it, 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 actually, it actually makes them divor divorced from their own body and they are um, in a state of deep alienation towards their, their body and which then becomes an alienation towards the self itself because they they're and what at, because they're human they're human they they're aware of the soul at some level but the in in the midst of, of the memories uh, they they're often in a in a um, pained relationship with their physical, physiological being, and then they're not sure what, what to make of the self in this. Um, I'm used to have these having these conversations in. Uh, in private with people that have gone through this because some of what needs to be said is not um, but there, 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 there are several things one there's always the question that I always get is this God's will and is this destined um, I think although modern Muslims have become, for the most part, Qadaris, um, I, I think Qadariya is deeply flawed. What does that mean? Uh, be, the belief in, in predestination for most affairs. Uh, not only is this not predestined, I don't believe it's the divine will. Um, I think that certain types of evil like sexual abuse, and uh, it is it, 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 a, a demonic will. Um, the, you know, we get into the questions of whether the divine should always intervene to prevent every evil, but then if the divine intervenes to prevent every evil, then the very purpose of existence and the possibility of goodness as in the same way when you eradicate the possibility of evil, then you also eradicate the possibility of goodness. And there is no way that you can eradicate evil without also eradicate good. Um, because when you flatten the playing field, it's all the same. So, but it is not, and I don't agree with the Ash'ariya that Allah that creates the act uh, like sexual abuse and then there is the cusp of the act either. Um, I simply don't believe that Allah creates the act. And um, and if you've heard me answer questions about, um, well anyway, let, let's leave the issue of knowledge aside because that's separate. So one, I think is it's to know that um, something that is thoroughly ugly. Uh, God doesn't create qubh. God doesn't create qubh. And I think we need to, Muslims need to re, um, rethink the issue of husn and qubh, of beauty and ugliness. God is beautiful and creates beauty, period. God doesn't create ugliness. And the, the only possibility of beauty for a, and in, I believe the only real possibility of healing for a person in this situation is to turn to God for healing. 
because what they need to do is to heal towards their own body and heal towards their own self. And that requires um, divorcing oneself from everything that the demonic world holds. Um, all the demon, all the 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 manifestations of the demonic, uh, w and to to steer away from the type of world that creates something like sexual abuse, uh, to steer as far away as possible. I don't. I think that to demand that they love God right away is is ridiculous. I think they need to go through a long process of understanding what happened to them and why they deserve to love themselves first. And before they learn to love themselves, they cannot love God. And the process of, of healing enough so you can love yourself and you can understand forgive yourself by understanding that it is not your fault and you played no role into it, regardless of your role, regardless of whether you are forced to cooperate at certain points or you, I, I've, in my experience, I've, you know, I've had people say things like, yes, but, but, I mean, I'm sorry to be so graphic, I, I, I had, Someone told me, that she, this was a woman who was abused by, um, and of course he would always try to point to, um, claim to her that her secretions as a woman prove that she's excited. Um, and that memory tormented her. Um, tormented her. And she has to understand that secretions or no secretions it doesn't mean that she that she was to blame or at fault. Um, the betrayal of a father towards a daughter in this situation is so fundamental and basic that there is no distribution of of faults. It's thoroughly one-sided fault. So to learn to forgive and to love herself is the first step. And once we achieve that, we start talking about how you feel about God. But without achieving that, all the shiuch that you go to and tell you, oh, just forget and forgive and love God, that, that's nonsense. That's, they, they don't understand it. We don't understand what it means to to go through that level of agony and that level of pain. Anything else? I'm sorry to get so graphic, but this topic, uh, Muslims um, fudge all too often. And uh, as those of you who already know my approach, Anyone that is worth calling themselves a faqih in this day and age, uh, they have to be anchored in the epistemology and the system of knowledge of their age. And these are the issues of our age. And they have to speak the language. And they, they, they you know, uh, a, a false claim of adab is hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is worse than any lack of adab that might there, there be. So, you know, all these people that respond to, to me when I say something like this, saying, oh, you lack adab. No, I, I, I'm, if I lack adab, you're being a hypocrite. When, when you don't tell people what they need to hear for some decorative sense of adab, that's hypocrisy. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of these... Um comments and posts too, so thank you for addressing that because I think most people are not comfortable 
just coming out and being very blunt about it. And it's so valuable, especially for people who are suffering. Um, you don't get, understand that you don't, that something like an abuse of a relative or a trusted person to a person that is supposed to, especially a person that's supposed to be in their care, doesn't occur without the, the demonic playing an enormous role. And when I say the demonic, it's not just Satan and um, as Shirazi explains at length, not the context of Surah Tariq, but anything in the human nafs that is that drifts away from the qualities of divinity becomes demonic. It, it, is, it is like drifting away from light. You, you drift into darkness and a deeper and deeper darkness. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I've seen some very strange things. The, um, you know, uh, 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 um, a cousin who would pray and 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 committed abuse. Um, I mean, pray or not pray, be you know, talking religion or not talking religion, or it, uh, it's all it's it's demonic. No one with an it was an ounce of divinity in them would do something like that. It's just as simple and straightforward as that. Uh, regardless of what pretense they put on. Okay. No? Okay. <clears throat> Any more questions from here? All right. Um, Okay. What degree of freedom should Muslim scholars have interpreting Sufi descriptions of the layers of the human spirit and intellect in light of contemporary developments in psychology and psychoanalysis? Methodologically, should Muslim researchers practice a, a degree of traditional quote-unquote purity in their interpretive developments by expanding on the Sufi epistemology, or is there room to synthesize it with how modern psychologists and philosophers understand the mind and the soul? No, actually, the, the best works at uh, synthesis have been done by, um, uh, and I'm, I'm, my, my Sufi English library is packed, still in boxes, so I, I can't, like, go and, and find book titles. But there, there are actually some very good publications. Um, uh, done by um, professors of psychiatry who are also Sufi. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, they're often converts, um, which is actually a, a good thing because they, they think out of the box. Um, but um, one of the most I mean, it, it's not a secret that what we often learn from Sufism and we learn from Buddhism um, and Taoism um, it, it's, it's often um, very much consistent, especially with Jungian uh, psychology. Not so much, uh, not Freudian psychology, but I, I used to be, I used to read a lot of Jung, and the thing that would strike me a lot about 
uh, Jung and his understanding of of human psychology is how m so much of it was consistent with the Sufi tradition and um, what I learned from the Islamic tradition decades earlier. So, no, there, there's a lot of work to be done in that. I mean, it, if Muslims weren't, I mean, Muslims first went, were so busy eradicating their entire Sufi tradition uh, by all being Wahhabi slash Salafi. And then when they got over or started getting over their Wahhabi Salafi phase, they had dispersed in the Islamic tradition altogether and, you know, swung the pendulum towards the West. And, um, it would, and left an extremely rich tradition that is, that, that could have been co-opted in our modern, modern discourses. And some converts are, are, are doing that. And that's why if I, you find these publications mostly in the West. Uh, but if, you know, w um, w when I have my, my um, library, or, you know, inshallah, one of these days, uh, you know, I, I, I might be able to give you some titles and be useful. Okay. All right. Um, thank you and God bless you, Professor. Absolutely beautiful. My question concerns the relationship between consciousness and the soul. I'm trying to sort this out. Is there a hierarchy of power between consciousness and the soul? Both have dominion over the body. Is that power equal? Since the soul lasts beyond consciousness and the body, it would seem that power is the strongest of the three. But because it is directly tied to our primordial truth, it is the weakest and the least exercised. Well, um, who asked this question? Rafia. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. That, that's a very smart question. <laughs> um, and I wish there was a short way to, that I could answer this question. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, the the soul, of course, we, other than we know that the soul is divine, it is the embodiment of all the latent energy of goodness that um, and inspirations and flashes of enlightenment that the human being is capable of. Um, now, the self is often the is a repository of not just consciousness but the ego, and the more that the ego is dominant, the more that the ego is incapable of tapping into divinity. And that is why so much of the emphasis in the Islamic tradition is on disciplining the ego. Because the more that you discipline the ego, the the more that the, that the enlightenments, the illuminations of the soul can flow unhampered. Um, so uh, we are born with, uh, with com com completely immersed in the self, with the soul um, sort of there, but the intellect slowly starts learning about the soul and tapping into the soul. But as we grow up, um, we often, the intellect, uh, the, the self attracts the intellect more and more to its side 
uh, and if we're not careful, um, the the soul is becomes ignored, atrophies, if you will. Not quite, but just not. Its powers are not exercised. the The more we learn to discipline the ego, the more we unleash the enlight the illuminations of the soul. Um, that's the short answer, but they, they, that's a very, very incomplete and inadequate answer because this deserves a, a full lecture, a full talk. Um, but it's, it's a very good question. Okay, any more questions? I think on that note, it's a good place to stop. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for this incredible session. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Um, and inshallah, we look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Inshallah. Have a great week.